this is a video giving you the key facts that you need to know about ionic bonding for A-level chemistry. So as we mentioned in the introduction to bonding video, at GCSE we very much have this black and white idea that substances either have metallic bonding or ionic bonding or covalent bonding and you can know for sure just by whether they're metals or non-metals. And we kind of treated all metals the same and all non-metals the same. But at A-level we can start to have a little bit more subtlety. So we know that ionic bonds will form primarily between elements that have a big difference in electronegativity. So if you have one element that is very good at pulling electrons towards itself and one element that is less good at that, then you will start to have an ionic bond. And ionic bonds form as a result of electron transfer. So the classic example is sodium chloride and a sodium atom will lose its one outer shell or valence electron and that will be taken on by a chlorine atom and we're left with an Na plus ion and a Cl minus ion. Ionic compounds form giant ionic lattices. These will contain positive cations and negative anions in a constant ratio. That doesn't mean they have to be one to one, but it means that if I take an ionic lattice, like say magnesium chloride, and I look at any part of that lattice, I will find the same ratio of one magnesium cation to two chloride anions anywhere in that lattice. Those ions are held together by a strong electrostatic force of attraction that acts in all directions. This is a 3D force, unlike covalent bonding, which just happens along one plane. Ionic compounds are solids at room temperature, and the reason for that is that strong electrostatic force of attraction takes a huge amount of energy to overcome. They can conduct electricity, but only when they're molten or aqueous, because in those situations the ions are free to move and carry the charge. If you have a solid ionic compound, then even though you have charged particles, they can't move apart from each other, and therefore that solid ionic lattice is unable to conduct electricity. We've mentioned before that at GCC we have this very black and white understanding, and we say that if you have two non-metals, you'll have a covalent bond, whereas if you have a metal and a non-metal, then you will have an ionic bond. And generally speaking, that is true. But what it really comes down to is the difference in charge density or electronegativity. And the thing is that a metal and a non-metal are likely to have bigger differences in charge density, and that's what leads to the ionic bond. But the closer you get to the middle of the periodic table, the smaller those differences will be, and the more you might start to see a substance which, yes, has ionic bonding, but those ionic bonds have some covalent character, and we have a sort of halfway house. So really, we have a sort of spectrum of bonding. You've got ionic bonds, where the electrons are completely transferred, and covalent bonds, where they're completely shared. And then in between, we've got slightly polar covalent bonds, and also these ionic bonds with covalent character. This is going to happen when the positive cation is able to polarise the negative anion and pull some of those electrons back towards itself a little bit. This is particularly likely to happen when you have a very small cation because the positive charge of that cation is going to be more concentrated over a smaller area. If you've got a large anion for basically the opposite reason because those outer shell electrons are less attracted to the nucleus and they can be polarised more easily. And when you have a particularly large charge on either ion. A large charge is going to mean that there is stronger electrostatic attraction and therefore polarisation. Compounds that have a covalent character are going to have a lower than expected melting point compared to just something with pure ionic bonding. You're expected at A level to be absolutely fluent with the charges on different ions. There will often be questions where, for instance, they'll ask you something about calcium hydroxide, and they're just expecting you to know that because calcium is in group two, it will form a two plus ion. So this is an area where it's really worth spending some time making some flashcards and just making sure that you are absolutely fluent. So you should know that everything in group one makes ions with a single positive charge, everything in group two makes ions with a two plus charge, everything in group three makes ions with a three plus charge, and then likewise we've got in um, group six two minus and in group seven a single minus. And you should also be aware that when you're naming compounds or when you're referring to those ions, those anions, it's really important that you never have a chlorine ion, you have a chloride ion. And likewise, bromine becomes bromide, oxygen becomes oxide. It's really important that you've got that IDE on the end of the name of the ion. You're also expected to be familiar with the transition metals. And usually when we're talking about these transition metals, the exam board will use Roman numerals to show you what the charge on that iron is. Um, but just for reference, um, some of the common ones, we've got silver with a single positive charge. Copper, you mainly see the two plus, but there is also the single plus form. Iron, we're gonna have iron two plus and iron three plus. 
um, and so on. But as I say, usually the exam board will give you Roman numerals to indicate what the charge on the particular iron you're working with is. Now, once you know the charges of those ions, you can use those to deduce the formula of an ionic compound. And basically the rule here is that overall the ionic compound is not going to have a charge. So if you've got ions with different charges, you're going to need to balance out the ratio of those to make sure that overall there is no charge. Um, mathematically, the way to do this is to look for lowest common multiples. So if we take the example of aluminium oxide, aluminium forms three plus ions and then oxygen forms oxide two minus ions. So those two can't balance out. But the lowest common multiple of um, three and two is going to be six. So we're now looking for what do I need to multiply each of these by to get six? So to get six plus, I'm going to need two aluminium ions. And to get six minus, I'm going to need three oxide ions. And personally, if I'm struggling with this, I quite like to sketch a little wall in the corner of my page and literally just go, how big are my bricks and how many of each will it take it to make it balance out? So here are some examples just using monatomic ions. So pause the video and see whether you can deduce what the formula of each of these compounds is. Hopefully you managed that okay. So potassium oxide is going to have a formula of K2O because potassium in group one has a single positive charge, whereas oxide in group six has a two minus charge. So you're going to need two potassiums for every one oxide ion. Calcium chloride is going to be CaCl2. Aluminium bromide will be AlBr3. Titanium four sulfide. The four here tells me that titanium is producing a four plus ion in this instance and sulfide being in group six is going to be two minus. So I'm going to need two sulfide ions for every one titanium ion. And then vanadium five fluoride is going to have a five plus charge. So I will have VF5 and chromium six oxide. Um, chromium six is going to have a six plus charge. This is that hexavalent chromium from Erin Brockovich, if you know the film. Um, and then oxide is obviously still two minus. So we're going to need three oxide ions for every one chromium ion, which gives us a final formula of CrO3. So you're also expected to know the formula of compound ions. And compound ions are covalently bonded groups of atoms that have an overall charge. If they're taking part in an ionic compound, and if you need more than one of these compound ions, then you use brackets in order to indicate that the whole ion has been um, put in there multiple times. So the ones we need to know about are hydroxide ions with a single minus charge, nitrate ions, which also have a single minus charge, and you might see these referred to as nitrate five to distinguish them from nitrate three, which is sometimes also called a nitrite ion. And then carbonate ions with a two minus charge, sulfate ions with a two minus charge. And again, you might see this referred to as sulfate six to distinguish it from sulfate three, which is also called sulfite. And then phosphate ions and ammonium ions. So again, we've got an opportunity here to pause the video and make sure that you're confident using those compound ions. Remember, if you need more than one of those ions in the formula, then you're going to need to put brackets around the whole ion and then put the little subscript number to show that you've got, say, two sulfates or three hydroxides. So hopefully you managed to work out that potassium carbonate is going to be K2CO3 because that potassium, we've already said, has got a single plus charge, whereas the carbonate is a two minus charge. And so we need two potassiums to balance it out. Calcium phosphate is going to be Ca2 and then brackets PO4, brackets 3. So remember, we're going to use these brackets to say that it's the entire phosphate ion that is in there three times, not just the oxygen or just the phosphorus. Aluminium hydroxide will be Al, brackets OH3. Ammonium sulfide is going to be NH4, all in brackets, twice, and then the sulfur. And then chromium 6 nitrate, we're going to need six of those nitrate ions to balance out that hexavalent chromium. So CR brackets NO3 brackets 6. So just to remind you, these ionic compounds are going to be solids at room temperature because they have such a strong electrostatic force of attraction between the oppositely charged ions. And it takes a lot of energy to overcome that force. Make sure when you're describing this, that you're talking about the fact it takes a lot of energy. Often I see students just writing that it's easier or it's harder. We need to be linking this back to energy and melting points and boiling points. Ionic compounds are also going to conduct electricity when they are molten or aqueous because then the ions are free to move. 
One thing that's a little bit different at A-level compared to GCSE is that sometimes you are asked to predict the crystal structure. And I see a lot of students panicking the first time they see this question because they don't really understand. All it's asking you is what kind of substance is this? What kind of properties is it going to have? So the question is predict the type of crystal structure in solid copper chloride and explain why its melting point is high. Well, its crystal structure is just ionic. It's a giant ionic lattice. That's all the question's asking you. It's the same thing you did at GCSE, but it's just phrased slightly differently. And then, as we say, it has a high melting point because it has a strong electrostatic attraction between the oppositely charged ions. So here's a similar but slightly wordier question. Magnesium reacts with oxygen to form magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide has a high melting point and has a structure similar to that of sodium chloride. State the type of bonding involved in magnesium oxide. Draw a diagram to show how the particles are arranged and show the charges on the particles. Explain why the melting point of magnesium oxide is high. Well, firstly, even if I didn't know that magnesium was a metal and oxygen was a non-metal, I know that sodium chloride is that classic example of ionic bonding. So this is an ionic compound. My lattice is probably going to look something like this. The easiest thing to do is to draw a cube and then to put your ions at the corners of the cube and obviously make sure that they're alternating. So you have positive next to negative next to positive. Um, because magnesium is in group two, it's going to have two plus ions. And because oxygen is in group six, those oxide ions will have a two minus charge. Those ions are held together by a strong electrostatic force of attraction between the oppositely charged ions. And it's the strength of that attraction that is going to mean that magnesium oxide has a very high melting point. That's everything about ionic bonding for the time being. So I hope that was useful. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.